Nervosa Excavating is a family-owned and operated company specializing in the installation of Title V septic systems. Cavosa Excavating is one of the largest septic system installers on Cape Cod. Whether it's upgrading your current system or installing a whole new system, Cavosa Excavating can do the job. Cavosa Excavating, 508-563-5530. Founder Abraham Penn taught a valuable lesson that has been part of a tradition since 1919 when he said, I'd rather make a friend than make a sale. For more than 90 years, Puritan has been making friends as a unique family-owned company right here in Cape Cod. At Puritan Cape Cod on 199 Main Street, as well as Chatham, Mashpee, and Hyannis, you'll find the latest in men's and women's clothing, as well as ski and tennis equipment, and much more. Puritan Cape Cod, 548-0116 or PuritanCapeCod.com. Good evening and welcome to the Board of Selectmen's meeting. Tonight is Monday, January the 14th. If you could all please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, first up this evening is a report from our state representative, David Vieira. Mr. Vieira, welcome. Good to see you. I saw you on television last week, standing right to the right arm of the governor. The, the million dollar question was why was I there? Because they actually didn't run the story for the reason why I was there. <laughs> I thought you were the supporter of the whole thing. I actually, uh, I was appointed uh, to the Special Commission on Compounding Pharmacies, uh, dealing with the meningitis outbreak, and we had released the legislation uh, with the governor that day, but they decided to run all these other stories based on the questions uh, that were asked. And I know that the governor was asked four times whether or not he was going to appoint uh, Barney Frank uh, as the interim senator. And as the governor was getting frustrated with the question being asked uh, multiple times in different ways, I said, Governor, did I forget to tell you I'm interested in the job as well? Uh, and they laughed, and then the governor left the office. So uh, it was good to be there. So now he knows I'm interested in the job. Uh, but uh, I just wanted to give a, a brief update. Uh, we're starting a new legislative session. Uh, as you know, biannual session, our filing deadline 
uh, is this Friday for all timely filed legislation. Uh, and so the gears are starting to slowly move again on Beacon Hill. Uh, today, the governor, the speaker, and the Senate president announced a consensus revenue figure of which our state budget uh, will be based on. Uh, that revenue figure is projecting a 3.9% increase in revenue over the next fiscal year. Uh, I have some concerns with that. I think that number might be a little aggressive. Uh, the governor also filed on Friday afternoon another supplemental to reduce the existing budget because our revenue projections were off in the current fiscal year. So uh, they're going to be basing the budget on a 3.9% increase, and, and we're currently looking to, to cut uh, some areas uh, in the state budget. As you know, the governor announced some what we call 9C cuts in December. 9C is statutory authority for the governor to reduce line items uh, within the executive branch, and he did reduce uh, some line items like our regional school transportation. Uh, he also reduced some of the circuit breaker, special education monies, and he has requested as of Friday that we reduce the local aid, the general local aid, by 1% per municipality. Uh, conversations with my colleagues on the aisle, I, I'm not sure that he's going to get that vote. The last time we reduced local aid in the middle of the fiscal year, we were way off. Um, our figures are not that far off. Our revenue projections were $250 million off in November. Uh, in December, revenues came in $133 million above the estimate for December, so it looks like we're getting back on track to the original estimates. Whether or not we'll fully recover before the end of the, our fiscal year at the end of June, I'm not sure, uh, but the legislature uh, will only grant the authority to cut the local aid uh, if we absolutely have to. That will be the last place that we'll, we'll go to see cuts in this fiscal year. So if that changes, I'll uh, let everyone know. I'll send out emails to the Board of Selectmen and to the town manager to let you know if, if that change is going to happen. Uh, January 23rd, a few weeks, the governor will release his uh, House 1 budget. I'll be in contact with town leaders and school uh, department leaders as to the projections that uh, the governor puts in his budget for our local aid and various accounts uh, over the next fiscal year. And then between January and the second week of April, the House Ways and Means will begin a series of uh, meetings or hearings across the state and begin crafting the House version of the state budget. Uh, I briefly wanted to touch on a few things that we accomplished this past year. Representative Madden, who had a scheduling conflict tonight, He's here. Oh, he is here. Excellent. He was able to make it. I wasn't sure if he was going to be able to make it. Uh, Representative Madden took the lead on uh, one of our home rule petitions, um, and that was the housing fund. It was Chapter 29 of the Acts of 2011. We were able to get that bill passed. Uh, the governor signed it, and we established the affordable housing uh, fund here in Falmouth. The House 3560, which was our local occupancy tax for timeshares and seasonal rentals, there were a number of those local petitions. I think there were about eight or nine of them. Uh, from various communities, many of them on Cape, um, and uh, none of those bills uh, were able to get traction. We met with the Speaker, uh, Selectman Flynn, Chairman at the time, also came up to Boston and we had a meeting with the Speaker, uh, discussed uh, our view of this legislation being a local option to close loopholes rather than to create a new tax, uh, but the Speaker was very committed in the last session of not raising taxes, fees, or other gimmicks, as he said. Uh, and he held to that by not allowing any of those bills to go through. So uh, that's something for the community to decide. If you'd like to uh, come back to the legislature, uh, vote again at town meeting, and, and send that petition back in this next, uh, next session. We also had a request by the Falmouth Retirement Board um, to authorize them to be able to purchase land. Currently, the, their enabling statute only allows them to rent property for their offices. Uh, they wanted to be able to purchase land. They didn't have any land in mind, but they wanted the ability to look at that. The town of Plymouth had done that a number of years ago, uh, and, and so we were able to uh, get uh, House 4317 passed uh, for them to be authorized as one of their options to purchase property if they choose to uh, do so. I know their lease is getting ready to expire in the next year, and they wanted to uh, be as flexible with the options as possible. Uh, the last one uh, from this past year was Article 25 of the April 2012 town meeting. The town meeting voted and sent me a letter uh, to support uh, a resolution uh, around the Citizens United Supreme Court decision about corporate money in politics. Uh, I have a statement which, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll share with you. Uh, it was part of the record. Uh, we had a um, League of Women Voters Forum in Falmouth 
Uh, Representative Matt and I were invited to attend that, and neither of us were able to attend, but we both sent statements, and I'll submit the statement uh, for the record to the board. Uh, we did pass a, a resolution, uh, 4375, in the House, calling for a review of uh, a Supreme Court amendment by the Congress to send back to the states uh, to look at defining the rights within the Constitution as rights of individuals and not of corporations. In a bipartisan way, uh, we were able to get uh, the leaders of the initial resolution to very clearly define, and, and I'll just uh, to read off this, that the definition of individual will be that of a human individual, not of a corporation, a union, a political action committee, or a super political action committee. We wanted to be very explicit that unions and political action committees are corporations, uh, and we were able to redraft the resolution and include the expanded language of all of those types of, of corporate entities. A couple of other things. Uh, the bus station uh, is on everyone's mind as we approach the 100th anniversary of our what was our railroad station is now our bus station. Representative Madden uh, has been working. Uh, come on up. <laughs> Representative Madden has uh, been working very closely with me. Uh, there's actually a number of individuals in the room that have formed a working group, a committee. Uh, Art Calfee, uh, Noel Greenberg, uh, Paul Dreyer, uh, Virginia Valliella, uh, who's not here today, and Jay Zavala has been uh, very active uh, from the Chamber of Commerce. We were waiting for a cost estimate report to be provided by Peter Pan for what it would cost to renovate the building. Their lease agreement says that they are responsible for the maintenance of the building. My predecessor, uh, two predecessors ago, Tom Kerr, got a million, almost a million dollars to renovate that building back in the early 1990s, uh, and it has gone into much disre disrepair. So we had a meeting uh, not too long ago in this room with uh, folks from Peter Pan and from the rail division of Mass DOT, and Peter Pan said they would go out and get a cost estimate. We learned last week that when they put out their request for proposals for a consultant to go out and do the cost estimate, they chose not to execute a contract to get the cost estimate. Last uh, Friday, I spoke to uh, Chalita, the head of the rail division at MassDOT. She has directed individuals that are already under contract with MassDOT. They're actually under contract to do this extension of the rail that's coming to Cape Cod this summer. Uh, she's asked to expand their scope of work and for them to come in and give us a cost estimate um, to bring the building up for health and safety codes um, and also for uh, the outside, repairing the outside. Um, we don't know exactly when that's going to happen yet. We, we need to meet with her again, but she just made that directive last week when she found out that Peter Pan did not move forward with getting the cost estimate. Um, just on that note, if I may, Dave and I have um, been back and forth on this a number of times. We were actually sitting in your office last Thursday discussing strategy, so I, I hope I'm not jumping the gun here uh, too much. But what I'm going to suggest to Dave is that he and I work on crafting a letter to Peter Pan and share our frustration and also send that letter on to DOT. Quite frankly, uh, Peter Pan has dropped the ball. They haven't held up to, to their obligations, and, and I think they need to. And quite honestly, after we do that, I would encourage this board to do the same thing. Uh, Peter Pan is, is a valuable service provider to the community, as, he, as they are to the entire Cape. But there again, they have been given a, a, a very good deal in their rent over the years, and with that uh, re reduction in rent came responsibilities. Uh, and quite frankly, they haven't met their responsibilities. And I think it's time for us to, to let them know that we are very frustrated and disappointed with the state of repairs of that building and expect them to step up the plate and honor their, uh, their obligation. Um, so Dave, I'll let you finish through, and then I'll just throw in a couple of things. And I appreciate you uh, mentioning that I was tied up at a meeting, but it was a good meeting. So I'll brief you, brief, briefly on that. Glad you could well. join us. The last uh, couple of things, one piece of legislation uh, that I'll be filing um, as an independent piece of legislation, but also we'll be trying to incorporate it as an amendment to the House, uh, uh, actually the joint rules debate, uh, is to allow a municipality to have one vote on a petition, a home rule petition to the general court, and that that vote be good unless the town meetings in the towns or the councils in the cities vote to rescind it. Because what happens is we have this two-year legislative cycle, we have the interpretation one way by Senate Council, different from House Council, 
And I know in, in some communities, um, you have to go back and get another vote. Falmouth looking to have to go back if you want to do the local occupancy petition again and get another vote. Uh, I don't see why we should not allow the town meetings to vote once, and unless they vote to rescind their authorization, to allow the selectmen to petition the legislature in the next session. Uh, there is a, a, a section in the state constitution which says that towns have the right to petition it. And it doesn't say that you have to do it every two years. This has been interpretation of the rules and interpretation by the House and Senate councils. So we're going to try to make it very explicit that unless a municipality rescinds its local uh, petition vote, that that be in full force for each legislative session. Uh, the last part I know uh, we read all in the paper and we were waiting for the final report of the wind turbine option group. Uh, and just as, as one member of the legislative delegation, uh, I just want to say that uh, when the Board of Selectmen reviews those options and chooses one of those options or you choose an alternative based on the report, please let us convene immediately uh, for any assistance necessary from the state. This community has gone through this issue for a long period of time. I, as a legislator, are ready to sit at the table with the Board of Selectmen once you make your decision as to how we can work with you to solve this problem for the town. I'll just, I'll just echo those comments. Um, a couple other things that I'll just throw in, as far as the local um, approval ch um, change, I, I think there's a lot of merit to that. Uh, traditionally, what towns have had to do is, even though they're in the middle of the session or the session is about to begin, they file a home rule petition again. Um, the idea of rescinding it makes sense, and that actually has happened in, in for example, in one of the towns I served, they, they looked to rescind something that was actually on, on the governor's desk at the time, so we kind of caught it just in time. So there is a bit of logic, the idea of, of a town meeting reconfirming, but I, I quite frankly don't think they need to reconfirm, especially in the middle of a session. We've gone to a two-year session. You haven't. You're dealing with annual town meetings, and sometimes biannual town meetings. Um, many of the towns, most towns only deal with it, 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 at least one town meeting. So for them to have to renew that in the middle of a process, I think, is onerous <coughs> and, and confusing to, uh, to individuals and to towns. Um, consistent revenue numbers, uh, I share Dave's concerns. Um, I actually sit on ways and means when those numbers were being presented. I think 3.9 is, is a bit of a stretch. Um, as far as the current numbers uh, being low and the idea of December being high, Quite frankly, I think December wasn't as high as what I had hoped and expected it to be. There was a lot of movement. You've seen it in real estate. But there was a lot of movement from people moving their money, closing their in their books a, a year early in some cases, so that they could do it, not knowing what's going to happen with the fiscal cliff. So, quite frankly, I was expecting a high number in December, but um, not that I'm an expert, but I, I certainly was a little disappointed it wasn't even higher than it was. I was hoping it would drag us out of the holes and we'd be reminding people to be, to be cautious. That was kind of a one-shot deal. Very concerned with what January's numbers look like just because a lot of people did get their business done at the end of the calendar year. Um, I, I really don't have a whole, whole lot to add. Um, I was at the Coalition for Children meeting and uh, I have to tell you, every time I'm before that group, it's like so many others here in the town. Uh, the family does so many things right. And so many parents and so many um, advocates for the children uh, are, are, are very proactive. And your board, I think, is, is a good example. And um, you're, you're the town fathers. So I think that bodes well for you. It bodes well for Falmouth. You have a very lively town meeting. Luckily, you have someone in there that can wield a mallet and keep things in control. Um, and, and that's terrific. Uh, but once again, it, it, it's not all doom and gloom. But quite frankly, once again, I'm sitting here telling you I don't see a whole lot of bright lights coming through that at the end of that tunnel. Um, I do think that the Cape is doing better than uh, what we were the last time I was here. The unemployment numbers have improved on the Cape. Um, development and construction, which drives a lot of our comedy, um, has improved, and that's a positive thing. Real estate uh, property is starting to move again. That's a positive thing, especially for the Cape. Uh, the other thing that you know, I, I would say from the constituents I've talked to, it seems to me that uh, the summer seasons have been strong, uh, especially this last one. I know 
Uh, Kevin, I don't need to tell you that, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but from the people I've talked to, it seems like uh, things are st have um, started to turn around a little bit there. But unfortunately, now the rest of the state is starting to lag behind where we were lagging behind uh, the last couple of years. Um, I'll also mention that, uh, you know, the, the speaker talked about the, um, the, the tax on secondary dwellings and so forth, and that's clearly a local decision. Uh, my towns will have different opinions. I think all the impetus that has been put on is to keep a little local decision so it's locally voted and controlled. Um, the speaker was at the, the Cape Cod Chamber um, annual meeting this year, um, and he that question did come up, and um, I think he, you know, he still remains open-minded about it as long as it's a local issue. Um, so with that, I think Dave and I are more than happy to try to answer any questions. Um, I tell you, this guy has been a wonderful asset uh, to, to, to me at the State House. He's been a wonderful new member. He's finished his freshman term. Um, so no more um, excuses. And of all the people that never used the excuse, he was one of them. He, he was terrific. He hit the, he hit the ground running and, and hasn't stopped. Um, sometimes all I see is the back of his head. So uh, with that, Dave, uh, it's, it's nice to have him on board. Uh, with, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to questions from the board, but I just did want to say I want to thank both of you for taking the lead in the uh, the bus terminal issue. Um, I know that I've received some e emails from folks, and it is a state property. It is an area where I think it would be best served to have you folks, meaning the state legislators, handle that particular scenario. Um, Keep in mind that it's a state property. Our leverage there is only slim to none versus yours, which is probably slim to a lot. But uh, um, I thank you for continuing to move forward on that. I know that folks have wanted to come before this board, and you know you wrestle with what is the proper venue, and I think your venue is probably the best venue. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think going forward, we might ask the town to uh, have a brief discussion at one of your meetings and to send a formal communication um, to interested parties just to, to sh so that we can show that there's a very uh, clear vested interest by the town as well. And, and to just peel one uh, little bit more of the onion layer off of, of the issue. When we sat in this room and talked about the investment necessary to keep the building up, Peter Pan said, well, we're on a 30-day lease. The initial lease in 1966 said that they would lease to the predecessor bus company for one year. And after that one year, the tenants would be on a 30-day basis where either the DOT or the bus company could end the lease agreement. So when they said that, I was thinking, wow, we expect them to put hundreds of thousands of dollars into the building and we can kick them out in 30 days. And so we began a discussion at that meeting of would DOT be willing to extend the term of the lease such that it is a good business decision to invest in the building, and they're willing to explore that option. So that's one of the things that we'll talk about. If you're going to only have them stay for 30 days, um, they're probably not going to put money into this building. Um, so that's one of the issues that we're dealing with. Okay. It might be helpful for uh, uh, before we even have a discussion that somehow you would get us a copy of what that lease actually says, um, unless we have all the facts and figure out where we're headed. I don't think any of us could speak educatedly about it. We'll be happy to forward that on, and, and you're absolutely correct. There's a state building, and Dave and I are happy to take the lead on this. Right. right. So while while I have you up there, um, it it often comes up as I move around this community, and and that's the idea and the ideal of the uh, registry of motor vehicles. If we do in fi fact find a home, is that still on the table? Is that still an opportunity for film? Um, it's always been a, a sore spot. I know. I, I realize and, and, that. And because I, I've advocated for it very strongly, and I thought we had a deal. This board was very responsive and acted very quickly. Um, one reason the, the, the retirement board, we got that uh, piece of legislation through in Yeoman's time, and, and you know, Dave and I both worked equally as hard on that. Um, and we, neither one of us forget the role of the Senate President either in, in all of our legislation. Um, she's been a wonderful advocate and needless to say she, she carries a fair amount of cloud up in that building. Um, with that, that being said, I, I never say never um, at this point. I was uh, um, feeling fairly good about the idea of having the retirement board looking at the possibility. I believe they came to your board and asked for the permission to, um, to, to, to void their lease if they were able to find something else, and, and I think that was a, a, a positive meeting. Um, so that's a glimmer of hope. I know that's the building that the RMV has, has looked at as being the ideal location of all the ones they've seen. 
Uh, the town administration has been very cooperative. They've been very responsive as far as the meetings go and their staff. Uh, Rachel Caprillion, the registrar, has been here um, twice and sat down with me and we've looked at different properties. Quite frankly, the first time that was when all of a sudden the depot and the state of repair of that building and the knowledge that it was a, a, a state-owned building came to my attention, you know, and, that, and that's been quite a while now. Um, but with that, with that being said, I, I have to admit I'm a, a little less optimistic today than what I was yesterday. And that's primarily because of the DOT report and what the governor is proposing. And one of his initiatives seems to be going to much more of a uh, interactive, uh, internet-based RMV as a way of streamlining and saving, saving monies. So with that being said, I see a need for it. Falmouth is the ex, um, excellent location for it, and we're going to continue to push for it. And as soon as we can get the, uh, the, the uh, Falmouth Retirement Board to, to find another home and relinquish their, their lease or their interest in, in a portion of that building so we can, we can go back to the RMV, um, we're ready to do it. As soon as they give us the word or as soon as the town gives us the word, we're going back to the RMV and encouraging them to move into that building. With that being said, I, I certainly would be very cautious in, in predicting that happening. Okay. Thank you. We're going to open it up to any questions from the board. Uh, mine was actually about the registry, so I'm all set. Thank okay. you. Sorry. No. Anybody else? Doug? Brent? You read my mind, Kevin, so. Try to? Yeah. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. As Thank usual, you, you do a great job. Forward, both as I said, you know, it's been worked out well. Dave and I have offices that are almost, almost next door to each other. So we, we see each other on a regular basis and we kind of keep each other on each other's toes when it comes to Falmouth and so forth. So Thank you. And once again, it's a, it's a pleasure to work with you and Dave. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next up is a Comcast NSTAR hybrid cable presentation. Uh, and there's a vote to authorize uh, to include uh, one, uh, 11 Mill Street in, in, in the initial permitting um, for Comcast and NSTAR. Good evening and welcome. The only thing I'm going to say is if you're going to work from here, we need to make sure the microphone because this this uh, this is being um, live at home at home, and we have more a lot more vi visitors at home than we do here. Okay. okay, great. My name is Wes Smith. I'm from Epsom Law Associates. And I'm representing both NSTAR and Comcast. We've got NSTAR and Comcast representatives here. We have about a ten or twelve minutes. He's going to come back over there. Are you going to go over there with the clicker? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We're going to do that. Again, I'm Les Smith from Epsilon Associates, and we're here to uh, speak to the Washington's Region Hybrid Cable Project uh, on behalf of Comcast and NSTAR. Excuse me. Uh, our agenda for the evening for this little talk is um, First we'll talk about our cable history and project need, and then we'll talk about how we selected our route and the alternative uh, landing location. And we'll talk about installation of the, of the uh, cable, and then our next steps. There are um, four existing NSTAR cables that cross over to the vineyard. Two of them on each of these alignments. Uh, only three of them are, are operational. One is out of service right now. These are all, all, all the ones that are operational and were installed over 20 years ago. And they were installed with a short horizontal directional drill at the shoreline, and then they were laid on, on the bottom. So they're subject to all the tides, of ebb and flow of the tides that are about five knots of very strong currents out there. Uh, Comcast leases bandwidth from NSTAR on five, uh, with fiber cable on um, cable 99, which is this cable that goes, goes into East Chop right here. Cable history, there's been a long history of failures of these cables. Uh, cable 75 failed in 2001, it's not operational. Cable 99 has failed four times in the last 15 years. Cable 91 has failed five times. Only cable 97 has not failed since 1990. So obviously, very hard to have dependable service when you have cables failing all the time. Comcast wants redundant fiber connection to the vineyard because 
they basically provide so all the service out there. Uh, NSTAR wants to replace the electric service that was provided by Cable 75 that is no longer operational. Our proposed new cable comes right down the middle here and then goes over to West Chop. And the reason we, we chose this location is we have a new ocean management plan. And for cable projects, it requires them to avoid hard, complex bottom, which is represented by these, these darker shaded areas here and here. So we selected a route that avoids the hard bottom, and it comes right up here to Mill Road. <laughs> uh, back in uh, March of uh, 2011, we uh, married O'Keefe right here from Comcast, contacted uh, Heather, who was then town manager, acting town manager, and she set up us with a meeting with uh, your conservation minister, Jennifer McKay, your town engineer, Pete McConaughey, and your highway uh, department head, John Lyons. We went out and took a look at the Mill River, Mill Road uh, landing site, and uh, they felt that that was a good location for us to do the landing. Other types of um, environmental issues we've looked at out here include wetlands. You can see that there's a beach and dew here, and we're going to be drilling underneath them with the horizontal directional drill. Uh, NSAR has existing service that actually runs right along Surf Drive, and we'll come right along here and then right underneath that stone wall to connect to it. Uh, Comcast will connect into their existing service on an existing utility pole by coming across the parking lot here and going under the road. And so the only thing you'll see here at the end really are these two manholes, a Comcast manhole and an install manhole. We looked at shoreline change in terms of what coastal zone management has mapped for historic changing of the position of knee high water. And it's fairly stable here. You have an existing groin. I saw this area right after uh, Sandy came through. This dune here was cut a little in front. It was overwashed basically where there's a walk over. There's overwashed much more to the west of here. This is pretty stable. It's, it's stable because it's, it's, it's um, all controlled within a groin system, so it's a compartmentalized shoreline. Flood zones, it's all in a flood zone, but we won't be impacting the flood zone, nor will we be impacted by the floods. Uh, it's outside of the marine water recharge area, right down here. The recharge area is shown here, going down towards Salt Farm. We um, conducted a geological boring. The boring was approved by the panel of CONCOM. We found most, mostly sand to a depth of about 40 feet, which is good for horizontal directional drilling. We um, have been through the MEPA process, the Mass Environmental Policy Act process. We filed an expanded environmental notification back in June of 2011 with MEPA. We actually had the public hearing right in this, the same room here, uh, back July, 20, uh, July 14th of um, 2011. We got our certificate later in July, and MEPA agreed with our request to do a single EIR, which we, which we did, and um, they requested that we continue to coordinate with the ocean team, that's Coastal Zone Management, MEPA, MassDEP, and uh, Division of Marine Fisheries for our marine data collection and analysis. We put together a marine data analysis plan, submitted to them, had it approved, and we did a week's worth of data collection out in uh, Martha Media Sound to basically show that we could get through the sound without impacting any of these critical resource areas. Our single EIR was filed, excuse me, in uh, April of 2012. Our certificate was issued in June, um, and MEPA found that we adequately properly complied with MEPA. Uh, Division of Marine Fisheries indicated no time of year restrictions because we were horizontal and directionally drilling out under all the coastal resource areas. Now, so that's, that, that was really uh, nice to hear that they had no time of year restrictions. That's pretty exceptional. Natural Heritage indicated that there are habitats for piping plovers and least terns on the Martha's Vineyard side um, that they were concerned about. Subsequently, the issued a letter saying, because we're horizontal directionally drilling under those, they have no concerns. Back last summer, Comcast and Instar decided to join in a joint project to bundle both optic, fiber optic, and electric cables into a single 5.5 inch diameter hybrid cable. So we had to go back to MEPA with a notice of project change, which we did, and MEPA found basically 
that we don't have to do a supplemental environmental impact report because our installation methods and equipment remain unchanged and we're utilizing the same group, basically having the same impacts that we were with the other project. So what does a hybrid cable look like? Here's a cross section of it. And basically we have three electric conductors here and two fibers and the rest is the protection for those, those wires. Horizontal direction, directional drilling looks like this here. You're basically angling a drill down at an angle underneath all those coastal resources. We're going out about 2,600 feet. You eliminate the open excavation of the near shore and impacting those, those type of sensitive resource areas, including eelgrass beds. We'll use water to do the final flush of the horizontal directional drill pilot, avoiding any release of drilling fluid. Um, here's what directional drilling looks like in kind of a schematic. First, you do a pilot hole. This is about a three to five inch diameter little, little drill. It's pretty incredible. And that's drilled out across under the 2,600 feet. And then a reamer is put on the, the drill stem. And that's reamed, that reams and pulls back. We ream out about a 16 inch hole. And in that 16 inch hole, we pull a conduit of high density polyethylene. Uh, and then, with, then through that, that conduit, the uh, optic, I mean the, um, the cable, hybrid cable will be pulled. So you need a 16 inch diameter to pull a five and a half inch diameter um, hybrid cable. What does that look like on the lot here? Here's our horizontal directional drill over on the, on the lot. And uh, that basically is going to go out 20 to 30 feet underneath the, the beach dune system. Schematically, here's what it looks like. We have a drill rig, we have a drill pit. It's angling out towards the ocean this direction here. This is basically um, the, the drill um, units here, drill pipe. They're basically placed on top of the drill here. As it goes out, they have more drill, drill pieces. Um, in, the, in the pit, we have drill mud, and we have a pump. It pumps the um, drill mud that's carried the cuttings back to the hole. That's carried over here to a filtering, filtering unit. So it filters out the cuttings, and those are taken off site to a uh, approved disposal location. And then the filtered mud goes back into the uh, drill stem again. Then we have trailers, some uh, generator, uh, typical structural equipment on the, uh, on the side. Here's what it looks like on your site. We have the drill here, the drill pit, a crane or excavator to haul the pipe over onto the, onto the, uh, the drill. We have the mud units over here, and the cutting units here, a trailer, a storage trailer, location for some trucks and some, uh, some trailers for uh, transporting material around. What is drill mud? A lot of people say is that it has this material, it isn't. Uh, what is the purpose of the mud? It's to uh, bring back the cuttings, also to cool and lubricate the drill head, and also to provide a stable hole by sealing it and maintaining that, that hole as you're advancing uh, the uh, drill through it. The mud composition, bentonite, which is a montmorillonite clay. It's a layered clay. It expands up to 15 times in volume. The water's added to it. It's pretty incredible stuff. Um, also, polymers are added into the mud. And polymers are uh, chemical compounds that add viscosity and lubricity to the mud. Polymers are usually found in ice cream, starches, cellulose, Xanthium and guar gums. Then, of course, water is a, a component of the building as well. And we have two more slides, so bear with me. Um, you know, You've got to stay with that microphone. That's the only thing. Okay. You've got to stay close to okay, that. Okay, we'll go. Uh, in terms of minimizing impacts to neighbors, the, the two impacts that people worry about the most are noise and light sources. Um, and the noise is of a, a typical construction type of operation. You have VHD equipment which is a diesel generator. You have other generators out there, you have excavators and trucks. But it's like a construction site, basically. So uh, in terms of noise mitigation, the work will occur in the winter or fall when summer residents are not present. So it's not going to impact the summer residents. And most of the residents out there, I believe, are, are summer. Uh, we'll establish stringent noise requirements for the contractors. And we'll monitor those, those levels to ensure they're not exceeded. We'll require mufflers on all equipment, self-adjusting backup alarms on mobile equipment, shields and enclosures on stationary equipment. In terms of light mitigation, basically aiming the light away from the neighbors so that the glare isn't getting into their houses, uh, utilizing shields and uh, visors on equipment as well. 
Next steps, we uh, need a temporary construction license from you folks and a permanent easement. Uh, I've been talking with Jennifer McKay, the Conservation Commission. We'll be filing with them after we complete our Cape Cod Commission process, which we are in right now. We are also in the Martha's Vineyard and Tisbury Conservation Commission process right now. And we'll be filing shortly with the Army Corps, Mass DEP for Chapter 91, Water Quality Cert, and with Closest Law Management. That's my, my presentation. Be before <laughs> we do any comments, uh, from what Mr. Suso explained to me this evening, and this is the first bite at the apple for the board. This is not uh, the final time that this would come before the board. This just allows this, this group to begin the process of getting their permitting through the normal channels within this community. We do uh, understand that there'll be uh, public hearings as we move forward uh, and that all the abutters will be able to have their say as well as the community at large in this community to be able to make sure that this project could be successful. Um, so with that being said, I just wanted to frame before we started our discussion, the board asking some questions. I do have some questions if I might. Sure. Um, if I could go through a couple of things with you. Uh, your drill, is that what some folks would consider a mole, but on, on a larger concept? I'm not familiar with a mole. Well, a lot of times uh, companies will they say they mole it under the street or something. In this particular case, this this particular equipment goes a long distance, right? It goes much longer distance than, than typical trenchless, like, say, under a, a street or that type of thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, when you say the light, uh, and you, you spoke about it could be disruptive to the neighbors, the light, are you planning on doing this in the evening as well? Some of the operation needs to go 24-7. Okay. It's very critical, especially when you're pulling back those stems that you don't stop, otherwise things can get stuck. So there will be some 27, 24-7 uh, operation. Have you an estimate on how long this project would take? Uh, the total project itself on this side will be about a month. So the drilling process, the noise and the light would be about a month's period of time. That's correct. Okay. Um, I do have some questions and I have something that... Uh, let, me, let me take, uh, take back on it. Okay. The month would include some mobilization and demobilization. So we're going to include drilling for the entire month period. Okay. So there would be some mobilization, mobilization up front, demobilization. So maybe two weeks plus we actually drill that project. Okay, um, I'm going to turn it over to any other questions from the board in regard to the process and, and things of that nature, but I do have some other questions for you folks um, before, before we finish, okay? Anyone in the board have any questions about the process they're speaking of? I'm not sure it's a process question, but certainly a question that was brought up at town meeting, was fall town meeting, when the town meeting voted against this, was what's, this, what's in it for Falmouth? Uh, so that they're saying, you know, this seems like all great for Comcast and NSTAR. Why should Falmouth do this? And, 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 a, and a follow up of what Doug's saying. Uh, specifically, there's some areas where uh, it was loud and clear, as Doug says, at town meeting, that we tried to get this approval at our last town meeting. And the folks at town meeting, which have to ultimately approve this, uh, were quite emphatic that they wanted to see if there was some. Uh, some remuneration or some in-kind gestures that the, the organizations could make. As an elected official, I surely can ask that because I'm working on behalf of these folks. Um, there are a couple of things that uh, I know that uh, we've had struggles with in getting Comcast, I know specifically, to be able to help this community. One of them, I happen to have a letter uh, from uh, folks who, who in the technology park uh, are unable to get high-speed internet um, because Comcast doesn't serve the entire park and is unwilling at this time to be able to provide that service. We have a technology park, and I stress the word technology, that's not able to garner and gain access to technology because Comcast seems to be unwilling or unable to be able to provide that service there. We also have an opportunity in the community for uh, we have a traffic management system that could use some drops at our traffic lights so that our town could monitor those, those uh, the traffic situations and the lights throughout this community. I think those are small issues um, in, the, uh, in regard to Comcast that would go a long way to tell folks in this community that you're able to work with the community on that behalf. 
Uh, I'm not going to ask for an answer this evening, surely, but um, I, I'm going to throw those out there in an open public format. Uh, in regard to NSTAR, I think there may be a couple of issues there that we, you might be able to help us with as well. But that was the thing I was holding and, and waiting to the discussion, and, and Mr. Jones is exactly right. This board could approve anything, but you still have to get to the point of town meeting has to be accepted. And I'm trying to find a way that, besides the fact that we're going to appease the neighbors, that the community at home knows that, in fact, there is some give and take. We're going to give a piece of our valuable property for your use, and you're going to give this community something in, in return for that. So uh, um, I'm going to leave it with you folks to be able to talk with our town manager and our assistant town manager as we move forward. And I know that we have to go through some RFP process because that's the new process in regard to this. But uh, if it's structured properly, and, and I'm sure the board will look favorable on that, and town meeting will as well. Anybody else? Questions? Any other issues? Oh, Mr. Chairman. Um, is there any other public comment? Okay. Mr. Eldridge. You want to identify yourself? And, and, um, uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman. Members of the board, my name is David Eldridge. I'm a vice chair of the Falmouth EDIC. Uh, I wanted to address the board this evening about this issue. Uh, last six months or so, the uh, Falmouth EDIC has taken the task upon itself to look at the Falmouth Tech Park, uh, recognizing that it seems to be struggling. Uh, as uh, late as last week, we had a meeting with all of the uh, tenants and, and stakeholders at the Falmouth Tech Park. And one of the issues that came up that was kind of uh, an easy fix in our eyes is that, as the chairman pointed out, is that we have no high-speed internet access at the Falmouth Tech Park, or limited access at best. So I just wanted to underscore the need for this, this improvement at the Tech Park. If there's a way to create some benefit for the Tech Park in, in exchange for granting this permission for the Comcast to do what they want to do, I think would behoove the, the tech park and, and by with the town as well to, to make this happen. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else want to be heard this evening? Okay, so again this evening, we're just looking for a motion to be able to allow these folks to be able to apply. Would you like Heather to make a few comments on the RFP? Sure, the uh, that'd be good, but I, uh, we're going to be looking for a motion be able to allow this process, and I'm going to let the uh, system manager, uh, Heather Harper, explain a little bit about how the process would move forward. Uh, yes, thank you. We've talked with town council on the press office, both Mario Keating and Dennis Galvin, and the Comcast and NSTAR about the um, procurement process that we have to follow. Unlike pole easements, um, the disposition of an easement on this property is considered disposition of real property requiring a procurement process under uh, Chapter 30B. Town Council's talked with the Inspector General about this. They view this as um, a process that we need to go through. Uh, it's probably something that needs to be adjusted in the legislature, um, given that the likely users, um, it's not likely to be particularly competitive. Um, so the next step that will come back to the Board of Selectmen on, not tonight, but at a future point, if you vote to move forward at this point, would be to ask the Board to um, identify this property as available for the purposes of a hybrid cable pro project. Um, once that's done, we would uh, notify the Central Register, issue a request for proposals, lay out some of the um, grounds um, the town under which the town might uh, anticipate granting an easement, and then seek proposals. Um, from that point, we then would be able to negotiate the final terms of an easement agreement. But that's the process. We'll try and do that as quickly as possible. Um, but there is a, um, some legwork and some uh, mandatory time frames involved in that. OK. So the board, we're looking for a motion to allow. Um, and again, the cost for coming up with these RFPs by our board, by our staff, we're footing the bill for that. Well. I mean, it is time, it is, you know, it's energy that we are doing for the benefit of Comcast and NSTAR. It strikes me I'm, I'm still concerned. Yeah. I, I really hope that they, these two companies reach out and do everything they can. The town asks every single time if they're asking us to do this. Well, keep in mind that we do have the final approval on this as we move forward. So um, they're, 
their ability to work with us will be shown as our ability to work with them. Good point. Okay, uh, do I have a motion? Well, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Uh, if I read the suggested motion here correctly, then I move that we authorize the applicant, being Comcast and NSTAR, to submit permit applications for their hybrid submarine cable project subject to the following. Authorization is granted only for the project that the Martha's Vineyard Commission, Town of Falmouth Conservation Commission, DEP, Army Corps of Engineers, permits all be granted. I believe that's my motion. So this is motion? That correctly? Yes, you do. So there's a motion. Do I have a second? Did you second. Okay. A motion and a second. Yes, sir. Just for you have to go back to the microphone. I'm sorry. Just for completeness, uh, could you add coastal zone management to that, please? So moved. Appreciate it. So motion and second. Uh, any further discussions? Again, any public comment? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Ayes have it. Thank you. Appreciate it. This doesn't have signature lines for everybody, but if everyone can sign it, we appreciate it. Next up is to, to discuss and vote our expectations for the process of the WTOP workshop on Tuesday, January the 15th. Um, just for the board's knowledge, and I hope everyone knows within this group that in fact uh, the WIN meeting has been, for tomorrow evening, has been canceled, postponed. Uh, they wanted to get together and have an additional meeting uh, before because there was some uh, different information that came back before they presented the final options to the Board of Selectmen. What I wanted to do this evening, and I have scheduled uh, two additional meetings. One would be for next Wednesday, the 23rd of January, for the walk group. Did I say that properly? Uh, the WTOP group to um, provide us the presentation, and that would be in the Herman Room at the library. Yes, sir. I'm going to have a conflict with that because of the superintendent search committee that I've already had a commitment for. Uh, I have been to almost all the WTOP meetings, but I feel I've made a commitment to that one already okay. and signed up with a stipulation that I can make it to all those meetings. Okay. Uh, so unless you want to reschedule it or just know that I... Um, the only problem is on Tuesday evening I have a conflict, so we, we could try, if, if you get some other ideas, I don't know, they have a meeting tomorrow, yep. whether or not we could post a meeting tomorrow for Thursday evening of this week. Is there any chance we could meet Monday with them at our normal meeting night? 21st? Yep. It, it's, it's a, a holiday, holiday, but I don't know if anyone oh. has plans. That's I don't true. have plans. I mean, we've met, be we've met before on a Saturday, so uh, that I don't have a problem with it. Doug, do you have a problem with that? I can be here then. Huh? Pardon me? You can do that? So I guess if we've got a little consensus here that that, that would be our alternate date, Monday evening, uh, for their, their presentation to the board, the 23rd? I mean, uh, that would be the 21st. 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 Monday the 21st. If we have to get back from them tomorrow, do, how early do we have to post our meeting to make it official posting? Well, um, we'd, we'd make the posting anyways. Okay. We'd just make the posting that we already had for tomorrow evening. We'd just repost for next Monday evening at 6.30. If they're not prepared, um, we're, we're going to have to really make some serious uh, overtures of how to do this you know I don't think they'll have a time a problem with the timetable of being prepared it's just whether they can how many of them can make it to that Monday night but right okay so um, I guess the next one after that see this when the board hit and I wanted to discuss the process meaning um, I understand that there's a lot of information for them to cover in the presentation of the board of selectmen the part of the process that I wanted to discuss this evening is whether we're going to take public comment that evening. It is a Board of Selectmen's meeting. 
So the question is, is that the proper time to pay, take the public comment? We are planning on having a robust public comment period. And the only, you know, keep in mind, we also have a very strict timeline to be able to accomplish what these folks had wanted us to accomplish, meaning get something on the town meeting in the spring. That would mean we would have to have something back to this board for the 4th of February because the special town meeting warrant closes on the 4th of February. We do have places held on both the regular town meeting warrant and the special town meeting warrant, but the regular warrant closes two, week, two weeks from this evening. It's rather doubtful this board could get the presentation, hear public comment, make deliberations, and then come up with a town meeting warrant article for the regular town meeting. So it appears that the only other opportunity is to go to the special town meeting. Now, that would be the warrant the closes, meaning we have to have all the articles. We have a place over there for the 4th of February. So we need to back into that. Um, of course, by this delay, it's really making it a little harder for this board to be able to move forward and be able to get as much time as we probably need, but uh, we're going to try to do our best. Doug, you've been our representative over there. I want to hear your thoughts. Uh, it is our meeting because we're official board. I know. Um, I know what they would like to have happen at the meeting, on the meeting that when we finally do meet, and that is that there'll be a presentation from their committee uh, with us having received the written report of this Friday, most likely, have a chance to look over it, and then a question and answer period from this board to the process committee. Uh, they're not going to have comments from the stakeholders as individuals, and they are not suggesting that we have public comment at this time. Okay. But this is a conversation between that group as a group and this board as a group. Right. And, and it's important to note, even though we're going to their meeting, it is a board of selectmen's meeting. So that's why I'm saying we need to come up with it. I'd like to vote the process here this evening. So there are no questions as we move into that meeting, whether it be... Uh, Monday night or Wednesday night that in fact we're not going to take public comment this evening we will provide as much public opportunity for public comment as we move forward so is that something you're comfortable with being their representative there that's certainly what they're they're suggesting is okay. the process they would like us to follow for the first meeting and are certainly pushing that we have you know a number of different other meetings in which public comment will be taken right what is the proposed date that we're going to get this draft report or whatever, so we'll, we'll need it before this meeting well, we have? Originally, we were supposed to get it this past Friday, but then they changed, so it would be Certainly would be by this Friday. Definitely? I, well, um, yes, definitely as that's the plan. There was some very significant information that came forward at the very last meeting of last Wednesday uh, that was not agreed upon by the entire all the stakeholders that would have uh, substantially significantly altered the, the report and they just need to really review that information and make sure they're enough on board that we really can be reading this report as it as represents um, as many people as possible before we really use it. I do want the board also to know that this room, with the exception of our regular Monday night selectmen's meetings, is only open once between now and during the week between now and February the 4th, and that is next Thursday. And I've reserved the room to do a public comment period uh, for each and every one of those parts. If we need to do an additional one, we surely would do so. Uh, but we wouldn't be able to do it in the evening on one of those. Uh, we would have to find another date that's suitable after that. So I know it provides a tough workload for this board, but uh, uh, if it's all right, I would be very supportive if we can do the Monday evening with the with the group, and then have Thursday as a public group comment period. And those are our agenda items. I, I would be very supportive of that plan. That sounds fine. That's great. Yeah. I mean, it would be Thursday night would be fully devoted to just taking public comment on each and every one of those 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 options. Let me put it that way. So, um, are there any other discussions you want to bring to this board in regard to this process, Doug? things that you think would be important for this board as we move forward? I think the report really needs to be speaking for itself as much as more than I, I do. Okay. So maybe we'll look for a motion, at least this evening, to not take public comment on the original presentation that would only comments would only be between the options group 
in the Board of Selectmen. I would move that be the process that we uh, use whenever we have the meeting. Ideally, I'm hoping that meeting is going to be Monday night. Okay. If the WTOP comes back and says they can't do it except for Wednesday, um, I would think that Wednesday is better than waiting any longer, even if I can't be at this meeting on Wednesday night. Okay. So that's a motion on that? Yep. We have a second? Second. Motion to second. Any further discussion? Any public comment? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Um, the dates we don't need to vote on, but uh, I just wanted to make sure that everyone at least freed up their calendar. We'll try to post for next Monday evening, if that's all right. Right, right. For, um, is there a problem with that well, on open meeting law being on a, on a holiday? Well, Mr. Chairman, that, that's a loose end. We'll need to double check. I don't have a definitive answer to that. I, I'm assuming it's agreeable unless there's some uh, prohibition locally in a bylaw or uh, perhaps a statute that asks that a board not meet on a national holiday. That's the only thing that uh, I'm not familiar with. Well, we will certainly check that out post haste. I do worry about the insensitivity of it, but however, I think this is just a time where um, we're under a time crunch and this is an issue that we need to resolve with this town and you know, they're just sometimes you just have to make some decisions and yeah. Okay. But just to clarify, Mr. Chairman, yep. though, if, if that, if the Monday evening meeting does not work due to unavailability of the WTOP group uh, or other extenuating circumstances, then you would move to the 23rd with the unfortunate circumstance that Selectman Jones would not be able to join us. And then there would be a public comment meeting on the 24th the next evening. That's correct. And that tw the public comment meeting will occur in any case that is your anticipation that's correct okay we will plan to post accordingly okay anything else in regard and to that? neither meeting the 23rd either 21st 23rd or the 24th are we going to be posting any action that we're going to be a vote that we're taking oh there's second? no votes going to be taken on any of those okay. those nights this is strictly to to ask questions to gain public comment uh, let's let's be very candid here there are people passionate on both sides of this issue and uh, it's in, important that we let people express those concerns to this board as we move forward before we take our decisions and make move forward okay all right um, that being said we'll go next to the uh, annual spring town meeting to announce the spring town meeting What we have is uh, we would announce the uh, annual Springtown meeting on Monday, January the 14th, this evening. We would close the warrant on January the 25th. The selectmen would vote the articles and execute the warrant on February the 4th. We would publish the articles on February the 8th, and the selectmen would vote recommendations on March the 11th, and we would publish the warrant and recommendations Friday, March the 22nd, and a special town meeting will be held on Tuesday, April the 9th. So, do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Motion to approve. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Great. Next up is to approve the minutes of Monday, January the 7th, 2013. Approval of the minutes of January 7, 2013. Second. Motion and second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. Aye. One abstention. Okay. We would uh, move to the summary of actions. Uh, we have a proclamation this evening, and I've asked uh, Selectman Braga to read that this evening into the record, if I may. You have a cup? No, exactly, Richard. Want to do it now? We're going to go through the whole thing first. Sure. I, I, well, you know what? Let's go through the whole thing. Okay. Number one, we would hold. Um, number two, we would um, hold. Yeah, I'm holding two. Um, number three. Number four. Number five. Okay. Um, Mr. Chairman, I make a motion. Hold it on. The, okay, you're going to do three, four, and five. Three, four. I'll make a motion. We approve three. Four and five. 
Second. Motion in the second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have. Did uh, I, I preempted? Maybe, maybe the folks from the road race and the recreation committee wanted to say something. Uh, I'm sorry. We kind of probably should have held. Good Sandra evening. Cuny, Chairman of the Falmouth Recreation Committee. Um, Helen couldn't be here this evening, our uh, Recreation Director, but on her behalf, um, we would like to thank the Road Race for their generous donation that they've made to the Recreation Department. Um, Helen plans on using that money to, um, towards special family events, and we are very, very grateful. So just wanted to say thank you. Maybe, maybe you might want to tell the folks out there how much the donation was, in fact, to the Recreation Department. Uh, that would be huge. The road race donated $5,000 to the Falmouth Recreation Department to go into our donations account. And again, we're going to earmark that towards special events uh, geared towards families. Okay. And, and Helen actually had talked to me a week ago. She said she'd like to do a lot of those special events in the winter time when right, things aren't right. quite as And busy. we do have a family Friday uh, family night that is very successful. And But yep, to plan some different events where we can help um, keep the cost down for families to participate. So, very, very generous. Great. Thank, thank you very much. Race. Mr. Kvosa, on um, behalf of the road race. I'm here on behalf of the New Balance Falmouth Road Race. Uh, Scott Gelfi, our president, couldn't be here tonight. We want to say thank you for the community for hosting uh, the road race every year. And uh, I think we've all noticed in the past few years the road race has really started to uh, turn some corners and do some really neat things in the town of Falmouth. And I think in the next few months we'll be in front of you again and we'll highlight a lot of those other things that we've done and uh, athletics and the youth in the community are very important to the road race. And this is another way I think that the road race has reached out to try and uh, support those efforts. It, 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 uh, it surely is evident that uh, the generosity of the road race as of late has been uh, extremely, uh, extremely good. Thank you. Mr. Chair, yes. uh, just because this was an issue I raised after the road race, it was the condition of the Heights uh, ball field afterwards. I just want to make sure the rec department felt that the uh, road race had been able to put the field back into the condition it was. I mean, it was a very, very wet and messy day, and just want to double check with them before we move they on. They did. Um, yes, I was down there that morning. It was rainy and muddy, and yes, there was a lot of ruts, but uh, it was all taken care of. Great. Thank you. As a matter of fact, I, I think it was done in, in God's speed because it was. it was pretty amazing that it was done in such a short period yeah. of time. We, we worked with Rocky Gomes at the DPW, and, you know, we realized that we're, uh, we're a guest at the Heights, and, uh, you know, everybody on the board understands how important it was, not just for the rec department, but for the neighbors there, and we know what people put up with. And uh, we started immediately on, it was, you know, the rain, there was nothing we could do. Uh, with the traffic that we uh, had on the field, there was damage, and we immediately went in, and it was recommended to loom it and hydroseed it, which would have taken months for the grass to grow. And we opted not to do that, and we went, and uh, we put sod down, and we, we met with Rocky as his recommendations, and. It was repaired within a week or so, and uh, we made some improvements there, which we don't need to go into now, but we made a bunch of uh, underground improvements there to the field, so. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Appreciate it. Okay, getting back to the proclamation, a number, uh, item number one on the summary of actions. You all set? Sure. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, helpful. <clears throat> Whereas the town of Falmouth is a no place for hate community, and whereas the no place for hate program is founded on the fundamental conviction that all persons are entitled to equal protection, equal opportunity, and the enjoyment of civil rights, and whereas Nobel Peace Prize honoree Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. devoted and gave his life to equality for all people, and whereas members and friends of the Falmouth No Place for Hate program have initiated and coordinated the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. National Holiday Breakfast, and whereas Falmouth joins other Cape Cod communities in the world on this special day and all days in recognition of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s efforts and accomplishments in making this world a better place for all people. Now, therefore, we, Kevin Murphy, Brent Putnam, Mary Pat Flynn, David Braga, Doug Jones, as selectmen for the town of Falmouth, 
by the authority vested in us to hereby call upon citizens of Falmouth to participate in all activities related to the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. National Holiday Breakfast and proclaim January 21st, 2013, a Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. National Holiday. Do we have a motion on it? So move. Second. Motion and second. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Okay, next up would be the re approved request for three one day liquor licenses, one drop productions. Um, if the board remembers we approved last me, week. Mr. Chair? Yes. Uh, just before that, on the, after the proclamation, if we could also just advertise that the breakfast is occurring on that Monday from 8 30 to 10 30 at the Kuna Mesa Inn. And this is an event that is sponsored both by the public schools with presentations by the Morris Pond schools um, and, and the um, I think also Lawrence School from some of their choral members and from some speeches. And the tickets are still available, um, $15 for adults and $10 for students. And reservations can be made through T. Foley at falmouth.k12.ma.us. Great. Yeah, you're exactly right. I had that on the list at the end, but thank you very much. It's appropriate to do it at that time. Um, next up is Approved request for three one-day liquor licenses, one-drop productions mm -hmm. on 6, 14, 7, 12, and 8, 2. If the board remembers, we approved the special event yeah. last week, mm -hmm. uh, and the right. applicant has come back uh, for the one-day liquor licenses, beer and wine licenses for the Mr. event. Mr. Chairman, the reason I held it was as you look at the uh, liquor license, it's actually from 4 p.m. to 11 p.m., which is the same hours of his event, and I felt uncomfortable the liquor license going the full extent till 11. I was thinking more in the lines of something like 9 o'clock, because you know what happens if they're serving right up till 11. You know, um, so that was I, my I, concern. I, I tend to agree with you. Actually, the event goes till 10 o'clock. The, the permit we issued last week was till 10, and this week it's on the application for 11. Okay. So, I mean, on, on the liquor application. Uh, there's one thing I, I know, having been in the liquor industry, when the entertainment stops, you don't want to hand them the last one before they go out the door. Um, and we all know that Fenway Park, they stop serving alcohol, it's the seventh inning. So uh, I think your nine o'clock idea would probably be the seventh inning in this particular situation. Well, okay, it is, it is 11 on this, on that. The, and who made the change? He did? Uh, that, was, that application is for the liquor license. Okay. That's not. It's a separate one. It's a separate one. All right. Well, so I've, you're 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 saying go four to nine p.m. I'm, in fact, I feel that strongly about it. I'm going to make the motion for discussion at least. Okay. Uh, there's one other thing on on the license itself uh -huh. that wasn't on there. We need to make sure I think that we keep a, a roped off area for the beer tent where alcohol will be served because we surely don't want. And there's just, isn't it always been the policy, there's just one area to go in and out? There's not an entrance, and it's just one spot. One entrance and right. exit into okay. the roped off area. Um, it, and the town of Falmouth would, because it's alcohol and town property, in, in this one day liquor license, we're asking for a $500,000 liquor liability, naming the town of Falmouth. Okay. So if you can make that motion to include your nine in those. I'll make, so moved, I'll make the motions, the additions you've put in. Okay. Second. Motion in a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Thank you very much. And last up on the agenda, uh, I guess that's it, folks. Uh, next thing would be uh, individual selectman report before we go to the town manager, and then we'll go to the town manager's report. Well, let's do the town manager's report first. It'll be a little bit easier there. Go ahead, Mr. Cecil. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a couple items uh, in addition to what's been uh, covered. Uh, Selectman Jones uh, noted the uh, uh, national holiday breakfast uh, this coming Monday, January 21st at the Kuna Mesa Inn. It's an excellent event. I had the uh, pleasure of my wife Stephanie and I attending last year and uh, certainly recommend it to all. Uh, once again. Uh, also, Mr. Chairman, we continue to work in assembling and reviewing the proposed uh, Warren articles for the spring annual town meeting. If all goes well, I do hope to have a first draft 
uh, warrant list for the board's information uh, by the end of next week and stay tuned for that. Uh, and lastly, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, consistent with the uh, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. National Holiday, uh, Monday, January 21st, uh, town hall and town government administrative offices uh, will be closed on that day. Uh, obviously, if we're able to have the uh, meeting to which uh, the board referred uh, the joint meeting with the wind turbine options group uh, that evening, we will make accommodations uh, uh, for that one single event here at town hall. And that concludes my report, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, any questions about the town manager's report? No. Uh, just from the board, any uh, any reports from the members of the board of selectmen? I do. Um, let me just say before you get to that, just to make the announcement mm -hmm. about the polar plunge. This, uh, I'm glad Chief Dunn has stayed here because we still have yet to get our firm commitment about <laughs> it from him for the polar plunge. I know that uh, at the high school there's a, a little bit of a throwdown, and it, it could be uh, the, the principal, Mr. Uh, Joe Driscoll who may be taking the plunge. Uh, is, it was a little challenge to raise some money at the high school on behalf of the troops. And I know that Selectman Bragger and I, and uh, I want to extend also an invitation for the uh, press to be able to walk the walk instead of talking the talk. And I extend the invitation of Mr. Kazarian to be able to take the plunge with us this evening. I mean, on, on Saturday at noon. I know that he has appropriate swimwear. Uh, I've seen it in the past. So, um, um, I, 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 I just want to... <laughs> what are you laughing about, Mick? <laughs> I just wanted to make the offer. And, uh, uh, and anybody out there, it, it's a great event and it's for a great cause. Uh, last year we did it for the uh, women's shelter on the 1st and we're going to do it, uh, Mr. Bragger and I once again are going to do it this Saturday at noon. I'd like to extend, you know, we send the olive branch to the rest of the members of the board for this. Doug, are you interested? I know you're, you're on the waterfront all summer long. And, um, uh, there's a good chance I'll be there. Okay. I can't promise it, but. Uh, Brent? Uh, uh, I have some personal issues that I would have to attend to, but okay. we'll see if I can fit it into my schedule. Okay, and Mr. Suso, I, I, I know that last year, you, you came close, you took your shoes off, but you, you never really got any further than that. Uh, so uh, uh, and this year doesn't include a run, I might add. It's just you go from Understood. a warm tent right into the water. <laughs> and Understood. I know you can speak from experience. So okay. I uh, respect that highly. All right. That being said, one last thing, invitation. And, uh, have we got a commitment yet from Chief Dunn? It's going to work. <laughs> okay. Uh, go ahead, Selectman Braga, for your uh, I'll do report. this as brief as possible. I do have 10 pages of written notes from all these meetings I've attended, so I'll go through it rather quickly, picking out some of the highlights. Because some of these meetings are far back as December 4th. And, um, but I went to a solid waste committee on that day. And the main thing they were discussing was other than other issues is once we get a new person on board to do solid waste, they were very concerned about like their future and what their mission statement's going to be. So um, I felt that they're still a very important int integral part of what's going to be happening. And I hopefully they listen to me, but they still do have a concern. Um, on the 13th, I had attended a ZBA meeting, and I would say the most relevant thing that really came out of that meeting was the uh, residents on the corner of Hewan Street in Maine, which is going to be four condominiums. That's Dr. Tripp's old building. Some of the neighbors had c concerns about lead paint because the building is going to be stripped completely outside, but the company, uh, act the person doing the project, uh, Ralph Crossens, a former building uh, Commissioner for the town of Barnstable. He's also lead certified, so he um, spoke to the neighbors there, and I think um, they understand that they're going to be fully protected when this building is tented. Uh, in fact, the contractor even went as far as moving the, con the uh, air conditioning units from the north side of the building to somewhere else because of the noise. On the 19th, I attended a beach committee. Uh, they actually had a big issue going on regarding a volleyball tournament that's going to be held at Falmouth Heights. It's still up in the air, but there's no doubt there's going to be issues with traffic and the use of the beach parking lot. Um, also, Eric Turkington attended that meeting and made the same thing uh, 
thing he discussed here the other day about the $700,000 project the board's pond, so I will not go into that. A discussion did come up about the Messina money again, and as I told them at that meeting, I will never bring it up again. I brought it up enough that if the town wants to reopen the license agreement with Messina to, to nourish that beach in the coming years, they can. I do believe, I have an email from Pat Harris saying it will cover a handicap ramp because that is an enhancement and not maintenance. There's also discussion by the uh, beach committee requesting $40,000 at some point to replace the gates at all the beaches. There was discussion of at least that gate at that beach replacing it would be an enhancement and may be able to come out of that money as well. Um, I realize I brought this up a number of times and I also know that 30 or 35,000 is not going to change anyone's taxes in town, but you know, uh, I think if we all can show that we're trying to save every, anywhere, I think the public will understand and have a better respect for what we're trying to do here and that's the only reason I brought these issues up. Um, they went on to say Falmouth Harbor has been dredged, 3,500 cubic yards have been placed on Surf Drive. That was with the assistance of the CPC funding, as you recall. Bourne's Pond, there was um, some issues down there with erosion they're working on. They've lost a dune. Eel River, 800 cubic yards uh, have been removed and will be going on the east end of Monot Beach. Um, there was also talk of the new roof for the Ellen Mitchell bathhouse will be getting done in the spring, but the sheriff's department, I think, has this as their number fourth project in next spring, so it may take a while to get them over there. Um, the neighborhood representatives were there from Farmworth Heights and Maravesta Association, very concerned about continual traf traffic, uh, parking on Worcester Court, creating a danger. There's not much they said to them, but it, other than it's a, it's a police issue, if you feel there's a hazard there, to notify the police department um, on that. Uh, the next ZBA meeting I attended, um, the only thing I'll bring out of that one on the 20th happened to do with, um, and I know we've received letters of this new cell tower going in, uh, 284 Old Meeting House Road. I did reach out to the gentleman who sent us a letter with his concerns. He was just happy that someone got back to him. I advised him on January 4th there was going to be a meeting open on the DRI at the uh, Cape Cod Commission uh, with a further meeting to follow at their post where you'll be able to give public comment. At this meeting, the ZBA just basically continued it and referred it to the Cape Cod Commission for their consideration. Um, now I went to the affordable housing meeting and some pretty good things had come up um, regarding some of their projects. Glenwood Avenue, uh, they were in the finance stages. Permitting is completed. They're looking at spring construction. 761 T-Ticket Highway, which is a corner of St. Mark's and 28. The due diligence, should have, due diligence was due back two days ago on the 13th. Um, the feasibility is hopefully going to be done, a financial feasibility, uh, by April 15th, and the comprehensive permit should be done sometime this coming July. The Odd Fellows Hall is in the finance stages. Uh, permitting is completed. The asbestos removal has turned up a little bit more than they thought, so the financial burden in removing that is a little bit more than they originally thought it would be. Um, those apartments are going to be minimum 750 square feet as required by LIP rules and regulations. Uh, Stevens Lane, the LIP application um, is recommended for approval for that project. Shore Street was brought up, uh, but nothing very important because Mr. Glasso didn't show up at the meeting to give the information uh, that they were looking for. Mm -hmm. I attended another solid waste meeting this past week. The biggest concern there was they had received complaints from the uh, trash haulers that someone had gone around on all the trash cans and stole all the holiday tips from the trash that were left out there by some of the uh, people at the houses. Um, the beach committee basically told them that, um, you know, it's probably a police matter, so there's not much they could really do about it at this time. Um, and whether you make some type of other arrangement with the homeowner not to put the money in the trash. That's a new one. I never heard of that before. There's also, they mentioned two more landfills are being closed in Massachusetts, Taunton and South Hadley, who have reached their capacity. Um, 
a future agenda coming up for the solid waste. They, they're going to discuss pay as you throw again. They want a mission statement for their committee. Um, they're concerned about um, some of the town dumpsters that we are paying for when they go to be emptied. We're paying the same amount, I guess, and I'm not familiar with this at all. And the dumpsters are not, not really full, but I guess you pay the same dumping charge. I don't know anything about that. There's not much I can tell you about that because I'm not familiar with it. Um, they're also going to be discussing the $180,000 in the debt exclusion. That is, money is still there to see what they can do with remodeling the, uh, our uh, uh, landfill. Um, there was also another hearing I went to last week again for the Zoning Board of Appeals. Another cell tower which is going to be modified at uh, 9006 East, 1006 East Falmouth Highway it had to do with really extending uh, the use of the, to bring 4G out to that area. And it includes a lot of more antennas. I think a maximum of 39 additional antennas if I have my notes correct. Um, all these other ones I have here are basically, I'm very interested to see how many people in the Heights are doing tear downs and rebuilds. I'm not going to report on any of those, but I do take notes on them. And that's the extent of my report, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Anybody else? Mr. Chairman, could I uh, ask on one uh, item of clarification? I, I noted that uh, on the preferred uh, joint meeting night that was voted by the board January 21st, uh, I referred to the availability of this building, and it uh, occurred to me that the meeting that had been set up was going to be at the library. Herman room. So I did not want to uh, preempt necessarily the location of that meeting if it does go forward on the 21st. Uh, uh, so I just bring up that clarification. Whichever location uh, ends up being preferred, I believe the uh, WTOP group preferred to meet in the library, presuming that that would be available on that evening. That's correct. And presuming that evening it would be a go. Are they open? If it's not available, I think we're going to have to have it here. But yeah, I think well, I think both buildings are closed officially That's what on I mean, Monday, yeah. so we'd have the a similar scenario probably in either case to open it up for an evening meeting. So we'll just be determined as to where the preference is to hold it, and we'll go forward accordingly. Well, I, I think it's important that that's their home game that we can do that, and I know that they can. They don't have to open the entire library over there; they can just open it. Go ahead, I believe also the Herman room has a larger capacity than this room does, yeah. which may be of, um, of interest. That was the reason they wanted to have it there. It does mean that we cannot have a live feed of the meeting uh, if it's there. Well, we can have it here, but they still felt that that was the right place to do it. Okay, okay so we'll go in options. We'll see whether we can do that Monday evening. If we can't, we'll go to Wednesday, and we still have Thursday uh, reserved. Okay, uh, I'll have a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Motion to second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Excavating is a family-owned and operated company specializing in the installation of Title V septic systems. Cavosa Excavating is one of the largest septic system installers on Cape Cod. Whether it's upgrading your current system or installing a whole new system, Cavosa Excavating can do the job. Cavosa Excavating, 508-563-5530. Founder Abraham Penn taught a valuable lesson that has been part of a tradition since 1919 when he said, I'd rather make a friend than make a sale. For more than 90 years, Puritan has been making friends as a unique family-owned company right here in Cape Cod. At Puritan Cape Cod on 199 Main Street, as well as Chatham, Mashpee, and Hyannis, you'll find the latest in men's and women's clothing, as well as ski and tennis equipment, and much more. Puritan Cape Cod, 548-0116 or puritancapecod.com.